Well, thank you for being here on this Sunday morning. This is the week of Valentine's Day, and I again, I hope that you will read the article that I wrote about uh, St. Valentine. By the way, if you're saved, you're a saint. Amen? And here was a man that showed evidence of his salvation by his commitment to the Word of God. And then be back with us tonight at 6 o'clock for the banquet. Well, today's message is entitled, God Showed His Love for You. <coughs> if you would, let's stand together as I read John 3, 16. <coughs> for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not tarry but have everlasting life. Let's pray together. Father, we do thank you for this day in which we can emphasize the love that was shared for this lost world by you, how that it was shown on Calvary where you shed your rich royal blood for us. Father, I pray that you would bring people into these doors today who need to hear the soul-saving message that Jesus died for their sin. Father, I pray that every person that is here will understand the depth of your love. Father, there may be somebody here today who needs to know that you love them. Father, I pray that they will hear that in the message and in the music today. Father, I pray that it would make a difference in our lives. And we pray this in the wonderful, powerful name of Jesus. Amen. You may be seated. Well, having grown up in the 1960s, I can tell you that we heard a lot about love, didn't we? Some of you understand what I'm talking about because you grew up in the 60s and maybe you're, you're a youngster and you have no idea what I'm talking about, but I'm sure that, that, that you've heard stories. Listen, the phrase of the day in the 1960s was make love, not war. Songs uh, were sung about love. Songs like what the world needs now is love, sweet love. And what people didn't recognize was God had already sent his love. They were just ignoring it. You know, sadly, few people knew what real love was all about. In fact, I guess the movie that kind of summed it all up was a movie called Love Story. Uh, everybody knew how to play that song on the piano or peck it out on a guitar. Uh, love Story. But yet, that missed it all together because the, 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 the line from Love Story that everybody remembers is, love is never having to say you're sorry. Can I tell you that's really stupid? Because when you love somebody, you're more than happy to, when you're wrong, to say, you know, I'm sorry, please forgive me. I, 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 it's no wonder people couldn't stay married in the 60s with a theme like that. Love is never having to say you're sorry. After 40 years of marriage, I can assure you, there are many times me and Donna have said, I'm sorry. In fact, there were many times when we would even say to our children, I'm sorry, uh, please forgive me. And it's important that, that we learn how to forgive. That's what love is all about. In fact, the love story uh, that, that I'm going to share today about how Jesus came and died on a rough, rugged cross is all about the fact that we need to say to God, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for my sin. I'm sorry for neglecting your great salvation. Listen, in the 1960s, we didn't know what the love bug really was. We didn't know if a love bug was a movie you went and saw, an automobile you went and bought and drove around in, a song you sang, or a virus that you caught. I mean, the love bug in the 1960s could have been just about anything. But, but you know, we're not that much different today than we were then. In fact, I believe... Our society has moved even farther away from the Lord because people are still looking for love in all the wrong places. 
Some people, as soon as they get off work, are looking for love around a bar, looking for love in a drink. Some people are looking for love in a house of ill repute. Some people are even looking for love in the arms of somebody else's spouse. By the way, church, listen closely. Man calls it an affair, but God calls it adultery and says it's wrong. Amen? 78% of Americans may say that sexual sins are okay, but can I tell you something? 100% of the Word of God says it's wrong and that it needs to be avoided. Listen, some are looking for love on a computer screen. And, uh, you know, some people actually find somebody that they love on a computer screen. My son uh, connected with uh, my daughter-in-law first on Facebook, of all things. Uh, you know, there are some people that are looking for love in a thousand other places. But today, I've got good news for you. If you're looking for love today, whether you're single or whether you're married, whether you're young or whether you're old, I do have good news for you because real love is found in the Word of God. You come to the right place when you come to John 3.16 because John 3.16 is the authority on the subject of real love. It's the most familiar verse in all the Bible. Yet, this is only the third time as your pastor I've actually preached on the verse, John 3, 16. And it's, it's interesting, this is the second time I've preached on it within the last 12 months, though. It is the most familiar verse that you probably learned as a preschooler, and you memorized it, and you could recite it. By the way, it'll probably be the last verse that you're able to remember when you're in a nursing home if you live that long. Uh, you know, that, 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 that's one of those things that just seems to be burned into our memory. It contains only 25 words, but yet it is the greatest compilation of words known to mankind. And so I'm going to ask you, would you read it with me as, as we look at it once again? Read this verse out loud with me as I read it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Well, let's look closely at what God has to say. First of all, we see the declaration of His love. When I say this is the declaration of His love, this is not the word of the pastor. This is the word of the Master. Amen? It's one of my favorite phrases when we come to looking at the Word of God because uh, some people think they come to church to hear the pastor preach. Actually, I hope you come to church to hear God speak to your heart. And, and so today, I want you to hear me. God loves you. Many people do not feel love today. I can tell you that there are children whose parents never say to them, I love you. There are some children that are cast away, and some that are being raised by, uh, by someone even other than their parents because their parents just haven't cared about them. Some children never hear, I love you. That's why when I gather with our preschool teachers from the weekday center, I always make sure to tell them, Tell the children that God loves them, but let them know that you love them. Tell them that you love them because they may not hear it from anybody else. And you may be the only Jesus that these little preschoolers even see. There are wives and husbands who never hear those words, I love you. There are single adults and senior adults that never hear those words, I love you. That's one of the reasons why so many people are looking for love in all the wrong places. But listen closely because the declaration is this, God says, I love you. 
Imagine that. The creator of everything. Look around, even within this sanctuary. This didn't just happen to come about. And no, it's not because some builder came and built it. God provided everything that you see. When you walk outside, you hear the birds. Uh, when, when you see the sky, when you see the trees, when you see the flowers, uh, know that God is the creator of all things. And the God who created everything, including the, the stars and the moon, he said, I love you. Now let's look at the definition of true love because we see that the Bible says, for God so loved. There are two words that we find in the Word of God that describe love. One is the word agapeo. Uh, obviously, there's uh, agape is how some people pronounce it. Some pronounce it agape. But, but agapeo in the Greek. And it, this is a sacrificial love. This is the love of God that no matter who you are, God was willing to sacrifice so that you could have the opportunity to experience His love. It is a love that is awakened by a sense of preciousness and value. And then the second word used in Scripture is the word phileo. And it speaks of a love that, that has to do with sameness. It's a brotherly love. It's a, it's a love of kindness. And it speaks of a sense of pleasure, uh, of being around someone that has the same values, the same uh, core ideas, that, that, that has a sense of sameness with you. It is a caring love, a brotherly love. And then there's a third word, in the Greek that is not used in Scripture. And unfortunately, it is the kind of love that our society gravitates to. And it's the word urso, from which we get the word erotic. And unfortunately, some people are, are, are tuned in to, to that which appeals to a sense of perversion. It's a sexual kind of love that that, that is, is not like the love that should be found in a relationship between a husband and a wife where there's complete sharing. Instead, it, it's a love that, that, that only seeks to, to gratify. And that's why you see, you driving down the road, you see something like exotic dancers or erotic dancers. And, and that, that's not appealing to a sense of, of sameness, of giving to one another, or, or agape, which is sacrificing for one another. It's a, it's a love that appeals to a sense of perversion. So uh, uh, agape love appeals to preciousness. Friend, if you're here today, I want you to know you are precious to God. Uh, uh, it's not uh, phileo, which appeals to a sense of, of pleasantness, of being around those that you share a brotherly love with. Listen, Urso, which our society gravitates to, is, is that which is perverse. The Greek word for love here in John 3.16 is agapeo, uh, which means that the world is precious and valued by God. Mankind, even though marred by sin, is still precious. To Jesus. Isn't that amazing? That while we were at enmity, that means while we were enemies of God, God still loved us. Do you love Him? Have you been loved by Him? According to the Word of God, agapeo, which is found in John 3.16 and found throughout Scripture, God over and over again says, I love you. I love you. I'm thankful for Michelle and Angie singing that song that Calvary says, I love you. 
You know, when we look at Scripture, John 5, 13 says, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. It's a reference to the fact that Jesus gave himself completely for our salvation. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love towards us, and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Folks, that's a sacrificial kind of love. That's the kind of love that we are called to give for others. To sacrifice ourselves so that others might be saved. When we give in the offering plate, we give so that we might be able to share the gospel through sending missionaries and carrying out ministry. When we come to worship, we leave this place to go out into a community that needs us to to share our love with them by inviting, by encouraging them to come and to hear the Word of God proclaimed, to study the Bible, the Word of God with us, and to fellowship with believers where they can hear about true love. Now, what is the distance of true love to our world? Well, the distance is simply this, the whole world. The world. World means many things in the Scripture. First of all, sometimes it's describing the planet we call earth. In Psalm 24, verse 1, we read, The earth is the Lord's, and the fullness thereof, the world, and they that dwell therein. There are times when the Bible's referring to the world, and it's talking about this entire planet. It also sometimes describes a system of evil that is in the world, that is led by the devil himself. 1 John 2.15 talks about how believers are to avoid that aspect of the world. But the world in our text describes people. God so loved the world. He loves people. He loves all people of all times, of all places, of all races, of all faces. The distance of his love is limitless and it reaches to all people. Not only all people around the world, but folks, listen to me. There is a dangerous doctrine that says that God loves some people and hated other people and predestined some people to a devil's hell. Can I tell you that misses the whole point of predestination? God loves all people, and 1 Timothy 2.4 says God will have all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. I can honestly say that I am a proud preacher of a gospel that includes the whole world. Listen, there's nothing about me I'm proud of, but I'm proud of my Savior, the Lord Jesus. I'm proud of the fact that He loves all people. I'm proud of the fact that that he loved all people of all times, and he was not willing that any should be lost. I'm going to get into this in a future sermon, but hear me closely. The moment you receive Jesus, the moment you ask Christ into your heart, you are predestined to eternally be with the Lord. Did you know that? Well, listen, God wants you to receive Him. God wants you to accept Christ as your Savior. And God wants you to spend eternity with Him forever. You see, God's love says you are precious. And that's the declaration of His love. Secondly, and I think Michelle and Angie said it much better than I can, the demonstration of His love. Look at what the Bible says that he gave his only begotten son. You see, the easiest thing to do is to talk about love, but never act upon love. There's a country song that says, too much talk 
and not enough action. Talking about love. Another country song says, it's not enough just to tell her you love her. If you want her to know, you've got to let it show. You know what you get when you play country music backwards? You ever heard that before? You get your house back, you get your dog back, you get your wife back. A lot of country music talks about love. But I'm going to tell you, nowhere should we hear more about love than when we listen to the great songs of the faith. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's not just enough to say words about love. You also have to act upon it. You see, when I'm about to perform a wedding for a young couple, I let them know that the easiest part of the marriage is saying the words. Because after saying the words, there's a life of commitment. You see, it's easy just to say the words, I love you, in a wedding ceremony. And a lot of effort is put put into a wedding. When unfortunately, I'm not sure enough people understand about the commitment that's involved in the marriage. Because in the marriage, there is a commitment. It's not enough just to say, I love you. You have to be willing to love even when that person is unlovable. (laughs) I remember the first time I told my daughter, you know, there comes a time in life, my dear, uh, when you're married and you don't feel love, but that's when you really express love by commitment. We were at a shoe store in the Orange Park Mall. Suddenly, out of nowhere, my daughter started crying. I said, what are you crying about? She said, you just told me you don't love mama. I said, no, I didn't say that. I said, there comes a time when you may not feel like you love somebody, Dallas. But that's when you really show your love. When you forgive and you give and you sacrifice and you're committed. And I said, let me tell you something, honey. I love you as my daughter, but there are times when you're very unlovely. And I love you anyway. It's a commitment. It is a lifelong commitment, and I will always love you because I am committed to you. You know, I think (laughs) after as many years as she's now been married, she's finally got it. I hope so anyway. You see, love is a commitment. And I can assure you there are times when you and I are so very unlovely to the Lord because of our sin, but yet God loved us anyway. He was committed to us even while we were yet sinners. And that brings us to the donation of his love that he gave. That he gave his only begotten son to show his love. God gave. One of the ways of showing love is by giving. Church, I'm not going to apologize this morning for asking you to give. To give of your treasure. To give of your time. To give of your testimony to a lost world through what you say and what you do. To give your very best for the Lord. Because God is a giver. We should be giving. We should be inviting. We should be giving to others our testimony of what God has done for us. It should be something that we share regularly. God gave to Solomon. Solomon asked for wisdom And God gave him great wisdom. Listen, God gave to Israel, even though Israel so often turned its back on a holy God. They were given a land that was rich and filled with milk and honey. You know, it's amazing that Israel was nothing but desert land. And in 1948, when 
when, when I believe God gave the Jewish people that nation back, it's amazing how in the midst of the desert, Israel is once again a flourishing nation. We ought to pray for Israel, not because of politics, but because the Bible says so. Amen? That is exactly what the Word of God tells us as believers to do. But God gave to believers, Christians, those of us who were, who were joined to the faith. Listen, He gave us His Son. And He gave us the great missionary, Paul, who took the message out. And He, and he gave us the church that, that throughout the ages has continued to share the wonderful gospel message. And on this week in which we are going to have a lot of cards sent on Valentine's Day, there were those who were the martyrs who were willing to lay down their lives for the gospel truth. And church, I'm telling you, if this world continues to go the way it is going right now, we will see even more martyrdom in the days, months, and years to come. It, I, I, I'm thankful for those who went before so that I could hear the gospel and be saved. Do you grasp this truth? Have you grasped the fact that God demonstrated his love on a rough, rugged cross by sending his son. Let me illustrate with my own son, Darren. Uh, you, you know, that's just a picture of me and him. I look a whole lot younger there. Uh, we're in a, it's a hot day in Texas, and, and there I am with my son, Darren. I want you to know he's my only son. I don't have another son, and I, I, I love this young boy so much. I remember when we were uh, thinking about what in the world kids were putting on, uh, on Facebook, and uh, my secretary, I've never been on Facebook, she said, Brother Doug, have you seen your son's Facebook page? And I thought, oh, no. What did my son put on there? She said, she said, you really need to look at it. She said, come around here. I'm going to bring it up. And there was a picture of me and Darren. And the caption was, my hero is my dad. I love my dad. You know, I'm thankful because he followed me into serving the Lord. And today... He continues to serve the Lord Jesus Christ as the associate pastor down at Southside Baptist Church in Jacksonville, Florida. And as much as I love Darren, can I be honest with you? I love you too. <laughs> but I don't love you enough to be able to stand by and watch my son sacrifice the way Jesus sacrificed and died. To think that, that, that this world was a burning building and that I would send my son into a burning building knowing that he would die for a bunch of people that the most of them wouldn't believe him, wouldn't trust him, wouldn't follow him back out of the building anyway and would hate him and despise him and would kill him. That's incomprehensible to me, but that's how much God loved me and you and the people outside these doors. That if the few, the remnant, would receive him, that that would be enough. I believe if you were the only person that might receive him, God would have sent Jesus for you. That's the demonstration of his love. Listen, God loved you and gave you a choice. You know, real love gives you a choice. You're not a robot. Uh, God didn't force you to be here today. God doesn't force you to receive Jesus. God loves you so much, he gave you a choice. 
He wasn't willing just to simply shout from heaven, I love you. He demonstrated his love by sending his son. Third, let's look at the demand of his love, that whosoever believeth in him. You see, this kind of love demands a response. Rejected love is an awful thing. Go back with me into your grade school and high school days. Do you remember the first time you got dumped? You, you remember how awful that felt when you tried to express that you like somebody and they didn't like you in return? Some of you don't have to go back that far because of, as an adult, there was a day in which your spouse may have said, I don't love you anymore. Listen, it hurts, doesn't it? When love is rejected, it hurts like a knife right through the heart. Now think about God. Think about the fact that he demonstrated his love by sending the Lord Jesus. What does it say when people say, I don't love you, God? Can you imagine what it's going to be like at the great white throne of judgment for those who refuse Jesus and they stand before a holy God who gave us all and they said, I don't love you, God, and they lived their own life and turned their back on Jesus. Is it any wonder that the Bible says that in eternity God's wrath will be poured out upon sin? Well, what is the designation of God's love? <laughs> it's that whosoever will may come. That whosoever right there in John 3, 16 is personal. You can put your name right there. The word whosoever means me. It means you, and it means every person outside the doors of this church. Right now, God's love is a continual offer to those who will receive it. And the duty of true love is simply this, to believe in Him. Listen, it's more than just believing about Jesus. It's believing so much in Jesus that you commit your life to live for him. Christian, let me ask you something. Are you really living for him? Have you really given yourself for him? When I was a 14-year-old boy, I stepped out of a pew and walked forward, gave my heart to Jesus, made a commitment to him, and he made a commitment to me. Listen, I, there have been times when I haven't lived up to my part of the bargain. But I can assure you there's never been a moment when God hasn't kept his promise. That if I would believe in him, he would save my soul. Well, fourth, let's look at the delight of his love. Shall not perish, but have everlasting life. You see, I can go to bed tonight. I can put my head on the pillow, I can close my eyes, I can go to sleep and not worry that if I don't wake up in the morning, where I'll be. Because I've been given everlasting life. Uh, li listen, I don't have everlasting insecurity. I have everlasting security in my Lord that I will not perish. First of all, I was delivered from something should not perish. That word perish in the Greek means to continually rot. And that's what the unbeliever is. Before I received Christ, I was in the process of perishing. It's kind of like when you go to the store and you get those green bananas and they look so fresh and new and then they turn yellow and then they get spotty and then they get black and then they just get nasty don't they because the moment they come off the tree they're perishing and, and that's what we are doing the moment we are born we begin the process of perishing because of sin in this world because of sin that comes into our life but the bible says that when we believe in jesus we are saved from perishing 
but it gets better. We're not only delivered from something, we are also delivered to something, but have everlasting life. Everlasting life means two things. First of all, it means an abundant life in the here and now. John 10.10 says, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. But it gets better because I have life in heaven. I stand next to the bedside of those that are passing. I often turn to John chapter 14, verse 3, and I read this verse. If I go and prepare a place for you, Jesus said, I will come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. Well, let me conclude. If you're looking for love, you're looking for true love. I encourage you to receive Jesus today. I want to close by going back to my grade school days. Because <laughs> I remember when I was just in fifth grade, I remember passing a note in school to a girl named Sharon. And it looked something like this. Do you love me? I love you. Check the box. Yes, no, or maybe. To my surprise, by, by the way, in a Me Too movement, I hope Sharon doesn't know where I am right now. That, that may be considered politically incorrect. But to my surprise, she checked yes. And, and we met each other in fifth grade. We, uh, we, we went to the fair. And we went with a bunch of other fifth graders, and I remember tossing nickels so that I could get one to land in a plate. And when it landed in the plate, I got this bracelet, and I gave it to Sharon. And I think she wore it for about two or three weeks before she lost it or something, but I don't even know whatever happened to her. I, that's the way puppy love is, isn't it? That's the way it is when you're in grade school, but I want you to know about a love that's much greater than that, because God says, I love you, and on a rough, rugged cross, written in blood, Jesus stretched out his arms and said, I love you. Will you love me? Yes? No? No? John records this promise from Jesus to each one of us. But as many as receive him, to them gave he the power to become the children of God, even to them that believe on his name. What will you say to Jesus? Yes or no?